Hey guys, welcome back. Well, it's taken a long time, but I finally managed to finish a couple of projects, not with my SCT, but using my Explore Scientific with these new Antlia filters. I did some imaging with the Tulip Nebula and M101, and I thought I'd share my experience with you and my thoughts about these new Antlia filters. Let's get started. So here's the electronic filter wheel from ZWO. It's the eight position filter wheel. These are the 31 millimeter filters. I bought unmounted Antlia filters and placed them in positions one through seven and because I had an empty spot and because I've had so much trouble with the ZWO Oxygen 3 filter and the halos that it introduces into images, I put the ZWO 03 filter into the eighth spot so I will compare its performance with the performance of the Oxygen 3 filter, the 3 nanometer Oxygen 3 filter from Antlia in a couple of test runs that I'll show you here in a little bit. But yeah, one of the main reasons why I wanted to switch filters, there's two reasons why I wanted to switch to new filters, and one of them is this. This is a stack of O3 data near the Horsehead Nebula. You can barely make out the Horsehead in this picture, but it's up in this area. The Flame Nebula is here, and of course a big halo around Alnitok, a very bright star right in the vicinity of the field of view here, is the thing that distracts you and, and uh, really ruins the picture, because after all, if you stack this thing, you end up with a big blue circle in your finished image, and you could spend a number of hours trying to beat that circle down to something that's not as noticeable, but it does take quite a bit of time to deal with these halos if you get them in your pictures, and that's a main reason why I wanted to switch to these Antlia filters. I've been hearing some good things about them, that the halos are not present or d significantly diminished, and so that's what I wanted to check out. Now here's another reason why I wanted to get a new set of filters. The ZWO SHO filters are 7 nanometers and they do let, let in a bit more light pollution. I happen to live in this blob about right here. And if you click on where I live, it's roughly about a class 7 Bortle zone. But that's based on 2015 data and I guarantee you it's not getting any darker around here. So I don't know if I'm still in class 7 or not. Nevertheless, it is uh, very bright, and so one of the main reasons I wanted to switch to new filters is to move into the 3 nanometer world so that I could cut out some of this light pollution and hopefully pull out some of the faint oxygen signals that I do have a difficulty picking up on here. I made a few changes to my Explore Scientific. I thought I'd share them with you. Nothing really related to the filters, just some things that... Uh, I'm doing now with it to make it easier to use, if you will. I am using my ASI 1600 uh, back here. There's the electronic filter wheel and the eight filters in here. I have a uh, off-axis guider. This is the ZWO off-axis guider. However, one of the things that I found a bit frustrating with the ZWO off-axis guider is that the holder here for the guide camera only has one set screw. So one of the things that I've done here is to purchase and replace that holder with this SV Boney holder that has three set screws around and very rigidly holds the guide camera in place. I did find with the ZWO holder that if you hit or touched the guide camera, it could pivot around the one set screw that was holding it in. And of course, then you end up with not necessarily out of focus stars, but certainly elongated stars. And that was a bit irritating. It was just a plug and play, remove the old uh, the ZWO holder and replace it with this three point support holder from SV Boney. Uh, I think it's a, a nice add. If you're using the ZWO off-axis guider and still have that single point holder for the guide camera, you might want to think about switching that out with uh, with another alternative that has more points of support. Another thing I did, because I keep having to take in, take out, rotate the guide camera here is I bought a set of parfocal rings from Farpoint and it's just a nice way to maintain focus position so that you're not hunting for a guide star at night wondering if you have it in wondering if the exposure settings are right you can just set it in and you know that you're going to see a guide star if it's there. I found these furniture repair angles these are very stiff metal angles that are intended for furniture repair but they're very handy because they have slotted holes for quarter 20 screws or for example, M6 screws. And one of the things that I, when I saw these, I, the thing that, that immediately came to mind was to mount it to the handle of my uh, refractor telescopes. And then with this vertical face here, I can use that to attach the plate that in turn 
holds the ultimate power box. And so now I have the power box held in a very convenient location and easy access to short cables, but also have taken it off of the handle where I had it mounted last time I used the scope. And that gives me access to the handle again, which in turn makes it much easier to uh, transport the scope in and outside. So that's, I think, a very nice add-on. And because these things come in a box of 10, I also added one to the front end. And as you can see, I have my ASI 120MC, the camera I would use for planetary imaging, but I have the all sky lens mounted on it. And this sort of serves as a ride along cloud cam, if you will. In other words, I can, I can dip into this camera at any time during an imaging session and see what the cloud situation is around the field of view of my telescope. And just for grins, I record images from this camera at one minute intervals all throughout an imaging session. And that way, if something happens, it looks like a guiding mishap. I can go back to the cloud cam video and find out if it was in fact clouds that passed through. Now here's a video I stitched together recently during this imaging session. As you can see, it starts off in the parked position here. Now it's going at one minute interval, so it's gonna jump a bit. That first jump was to a start where I could do some focusing waiting on M101 to get to the meridian. And then once it gets to the meridian, then it jumps over to M101 and follows it down. And now you can see some clouds moving through. These didn't happen to bother me at all, so there were no issues here. And once M101 gets down low enough, I switch to the other side of the meridian and pick up the Tulip Nebula and follow it on up to the meridian where I have to do a meridian flip about right here. And then I just follow SH2101, the Tulip Nebula, down until daybreak. And then we'll uh, park the scope. And you can see there's some clouds forming around, but none of them pose a problem with my images. And then finally the scope is parked and I'm done for the night. So there you have it, a typical astrophotography session with a ride along camera seeing what the telescope sees, but in a much wider angle of view. From a focusing perspective and guiding perspective, focusing has been excellent. I've been using Hocus Focus of late. I cut my teeth on Hocus Focus using my SCTs. If you can get an SCT to focus, then a wide angle refractor is gonna be a breeze. And this has been perfect. I've been getting great results all throughout the night. You can see that my R squared values are 1.0 or 0.99. Uh, temperature, in this case, we're in the hot months here in Texas. So that's going from 33 degrees down to 27 degrees. So roughly a six degree C uh, drop in temperature. And then there's the corresponding shift in these curves as they march over to the left as the temperature drops. As you can see, the half flux radius variation is very low. So Hocus Focus is, is working uh, like a charm with my refractors. And it's a pleasure to use after dealing with the SCT. It's always one of the nice things I like when moving back into nebula season is being able to uh, set the SCT on the shelf and ignore it for a while because it's such a pain to image with that thing. And the guiding has also been very good during this period of imaging. On this particular night, I managed to get guiding better than 0.4 arc seconds 80% of the time, which is probably the best guiding I have seen since I've had this EQ6R. The average guiding error is 0.33 arc seconds RMS. During this uh, data acquisition period for the TULIP and the M101, I've been getting excellent focus results and excellent guiding results out of the EQ6R. Now in a recent video, I used the Batnoff mask to compute the filter offsets for the SCT and found that the Antlia filters were par focal and I didn't have to introduce focuser step offsets for the filters. I could just focus with the luminous filter and then use that same focuser position for all the other filters. So I repeated that same test with this refractor, again using the Batnoff mask, and I found essentially the same results when you consider Pegasus Astro Focus Q2 has a much finer step size than does the Celestron Focus focus motor. This is one of the really nice features of the Antlia filters is that they are par focal. As I mentioned that I had the ZWO Oxygen 3 filter in the uh, filter wheel along with the 3 nanometer Oxygen 3 filter from Antlia. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of images taken one right after the other. In this case, it's FAD or FECTA, depending on which pronunciation you go with. It's not a overly bright star, magnitude 2.4. Uh, it's still a fairly bright star. But you can see on the left, I've got a an image of 200 seconds duration from
from the Antlia 3 nanometer filter. And then on the right, I've got the ZWO 7 nanometer oxygen 3 filter at 100 seconds. And so this is one of the things that I'm doing with my, as I take images now, my imaging time or exposure time is about a two to one of what I was using for the SHO filters. So that's why I'm using 100 seconds for ZWO filter and 200 seconds for the Antlia filter to kind of get the same rough amount of light through the three nanometers as I'm getting through the seven nanometers. And you can see it a very clear halo around even this star with the ZWO filter that I'm not getting with the Antlia filter. So in this case, for this particular star, you can certainly see that the Antlia filter is performing better than the ZWO filter uh, did for this particular star. All I'm talking isn't available right now. Alcade, which has a magnitude of 1.5, very close to what Onatok is, is available. So here's another comparison. In this case, I have a 400 second duration exposure with the Antlia filter, and I'm comparing that to a 200 second exposure with the ZWO filter, and you can see there's quite a bit of difference here. Now, there is some geometric um, background here that presumably is associated with the filter. It's in both uh, images. There is a bright halo immediately around Alcade that is in the ZWO image that is not really present in the Antlia filter. And then you have these larger halos, this secondary halo and then this tertiary halo, large diameter out here that are present to some degree, to a much weakened degree, the Antlia filter isn't totally eliminating these halos, but it is cutting down on them quite a bit. But all in all, uh, this is a certainly a, a big improvement over what I was seeing with the ZWO filter and with the three nanometer bandwidth versus the seven nanometer bandwidth, I have much more protection against light pollution. Now this is zoomed in on the portion of the Tulip Nebula where there's just a tad bit of oxygen signal. This isn't the best uh, comparison. I'm only looking at a thousand seconds of imaging time with the Antlia filter. So that's two 500 second duration exposures that are added together or averaged together. While over here with the ZWO filter, I've got two 300 second exposures and a 400 second exposure using the, uh, the ZWO Oxygen 3 filter. So a thousand seconds total for each of these two. And I don't know if you can see it, but I think I can see a bit more of the signal here. There's not much of it in the tulip, uh, but I feel like I can see a bit more uh, signal here in the oxygen on the Antlia side versus the ZWO side. So what I'm ultimately gonna have to do is compare the final stacked Antlia oxygen image with a final stacked ZWO image. So I've done some quick processing on the two projects that I've finished. This is the RGB image, so it's RGB only, and that's three hours in each of R, G, and B. I put a light stretch on this. I saw no artifacts. There's nothing to hint at a problem with the uh, RGB filters from Antlia. M101 is a good target for an RGB and HA combination because there is so much HA in the arms. And so I did take another three hours of data with the hydrogen alpha. So the hydrogen alpha is giving us lots of definition along the spiral arms. And then I have about 12 hours of luminance data using the Antlia luminance filter. And when I combine those, I get an image like this in the big field of view, or if you zoom back in, this is kind of what I'm getting right now. I've got to go back and revisit the processing of these images. I tell you, I think one of my biggest challenges with broadband targets like galaxies is dealing with this light pollution in the area here. Honestly, I can't make a big case to say that the LRGB filters from Antlia are better than the LRGB filters from ZWO. For all intents and purposes, they're the same. Let's go take a look at the SHO data. Here's the stacked oxygen data. It's seven hours. There's that little zoomed in portion we were looking at a minute ago is this area right in here. So this is about the the peak of the oxygen contribution to the tulip nebula. There's just not a whole lot here, although there may well be some faint hints of it uh, around this, uh, in this whole field of view. This is the concentration of it. I have another roughly seven hours for the uh, sulfur data. Here you get much more nebulosity in this arm that reaches up through here, and then of course uh, accenting the whole area of the tulip. And then finally, of course, the hydrogen alpha is very bright in the tulip area, and I'm picking up some good nebulosity around 
the tulip. I think the Antlia filters are doing a, a great job here. I don't see any artifacts in any of these images. There are no super bright stars. I think the brightest star is this guy over here. And certainly there's no halo or any hint of a halo around that star. I also took an hour each of data in the RGB to get the RGB stars and then used the new script, the generalized hyperbolic stretch script that's available in PixInsight to stretch the stars and try to maintain the color in the stars. And then I'm going to add that to the SHO combination when I combine these three images back here into the SHO combination. Do a little bit of adjustment with the colors. I can combine the two and get at least my first cut at the Tulip Nebula with RGB stars. I'm very pleased with what these filters are giving me. I am having to kick up the exposure time quite a bit. I was imaging usually around 300 to 400 second exposures to get the histogram for the SHO filters from ZWO off the left side. I find that 500 seconds is not even enough. I've been doing some imaging lately with 600 seconds and maybe that's just on the edge of being sufficient. Yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with these filters. The whole reason to buy new filters came down to two things. First of all, I was getting some fairly uh, obnoxious looking halos in my with my ZWO's SHO filters, particularly the oxygen filter, but occasionally in some of the other filters as well. And I live in a very light polluted zone, so I wanted to cut down on the light pollution. And the only filters you have an opportunity to do that with are your narrowband filters where you can go from a 7 nanometer down to a 3 nanometer, which is what I did with in going from the ZWO to the Antlia filters and that cuts out some of the light pollution and, and brings in more of the signal that you're actually looking for. I went with the unmounted filters. I think there are a lot of advantages to mounted filters. First of all, they're easier to install, not nearly as stressful to install as the unmounted filters. Mounted filters eliminate the, well, which way do I insert the filter? Is it, do I turn it this way or do I turn it that way? And three, if it's screwed in tightly, it can't move, whereas there's a little bit of free play, of course, around an unmounted filter, and theoretically it could slip a little bit. And if there's a dust speck on the filter, then that will show up as something that a flat is not going to be able to get rid of because the flat's only going to be a flat for one imaging orientation of that filter, and it won't capture how the filter might have moved over a given imaging session. But the main thing for me was to avoid a possible interference with that low clearance CWO filter wheel. There is no evidence as I look at the subs from each of the filters, the L, R, G, B, S, H, O. There's no evidence at all that there's anything amiss. In other words, there's, I don't know what it would look like if the filter was in the wrong way. I don't know if it's possible for the filter to be in the wrong way. But I did send a question to Antlier Support and asked them if there was a proper way to install the filter, and they said either way is fine. I've confirmed now with the SCT and this ED-102 700 millimeter scope that the filter set is parfocal, almost to the point of being precisely parfocal, meaning that you don't have to enter in any offset steps at all. So that's an awesome benefit of this filter set. I am seeing much reduced star halos with the Antlia Oxygen 3 filter compared with the CWO filter that I had been using, and that's one of the main reasons I wanted to switch to a different filter set, is just to get rid of those really large halos around really bright stars. I have found that I need to increase the exposure time for my th for these three nanometer filters as you might expect when going from seven nanometers. So I used to uh, expose uh, images in SHO for then about the 300 to 400 second time range for each exposure and now I'm using uh, 600 seconds. I'm very pleased with the unmounted Antlia filter set that I have, the L, RGB, and the 3 nanometer SHO filters. I think they're performing very well and uh, so far so good. Can't wait to use them on more stressing targets that have a bright star in the field of view to see how they truly hold up under that kind of a challenge. But yeah, these filters seem to be working great and I think they're as filters go, they are fairly reasonably priced. So if you're in the market, give these in consideration. Okay, guys. Well, for now, I've got some clear size, so I'm going to keep on imaging. I got two targets I just started up last night. So here's an early preview of what the data look like for M16, the Eagle Nebula. I've got one hour in each of SHNO, so I did a quick combine on those data just to make sure everything was working out. And I think that's going to be a great image with just three hours. That's not a bad image to start off with. And of course, with SH286, it's a much fainter target. I've never shot it before, but also have three hours on it with one hour each in SHNO. And I think that'll be kind of an interesting target, but it will take a bit more data to get detail from SH 
SH-286. It's not bright at all. Anyway, I'll keep plugging away while the skies are clear, and I'll talk to you guys later. See you.